Venezuela's dictator dances. Right outside, people suffer and die. It's so cruel and unnecessary. Venezuela should be rich. Not long ago, Venezuela was the richest country in Latin America. It still has greater oil reserves than Saudi Arabia. But today, Venezuelans starve. These people are fighting over bags of flour. No hay alimentos, no hay nada. And then there's the violence. One Venezuelan is murdered every 20 minutes. So are American celebrities who praised Hugo Chavez's people's revolution, now embarrassed by what they said? Will they admit they were wrong? Leftist intellectual Noam Chomsky fawned over Chavez, said he's made a better world. See how a better world is being created and can speak to the person who's inspired it. Actor Sean Penn met with Chavez and said this. He's done the moment uh, in incredible things for uh, the 80% of the people that are very poor there. Actor Danny Glover did some playful boxing and hugging with Chavez. Then he praised his vision for humanity. Michael Moore claimed Chavez eliminated 75% of extreme poverty. Come on, Michael. Chavez added to extreme poverty. Who is Hugo Chavez? Director Oliver Stone made this insipid film celebrating Chavez and Latin American socialism. Take an incredible look at an extraordinary movement. No, they're not. Now they starve and fear they'll be killed. Model Naomi Campbell went to Venezuela and said, I'm amazed to see the love for the social program. We ask all of them if they'd talk about their love of Chavez. Only one responded, Noam Chomsky. His anti-capitalist teachings have misled millions of students, but they've worked for Chomsky. After he praised Chavez's sharp poverty reduction, Chavez returned the favor by holding up Chomsky's book at the UN. That made it a bestseller. So is Chomsky now ashamed of his praise? No, he wrote me. He said at the time he praised Chavez, Venezuela had seen a remarkable reduction in poverty. He cited this Harvard Magazine article. But this was written by a leftist who helped write Oliver Stone's movie. So I asked Chomsky, given the current crisis in Venezuela, should you now say to the students who've learned from you, socialism wrecks people's lives? Chomsky wrote me back, I never described Chavez's state capitalist government as socialist. Private capitalism remained. Capitalists were free to undermine the economy in all sorts of ways, like massive export of capital. What? Capitalists exported capital and undermined the economy by abandoning their homes and fleeing across the border to Colombia? Thousands of Venezuelans cross daily in search of food, medicine, and work. These people are socialist fools. Useful idiots, Lenin would have called them. As much as I'd enjoy rubbing their noses in their stupidity now, I cannot rejoice because I know Venezuela's descent into chaos will not be the last time we hear of a dying socialist economy. Socialism failed in all these places. We are yet to see one socialist country succeed. And yet, sadly, they and other countries refuse to learn the lessons of history. Other countries will give socialism a go. Useful idiots will sing socialism's praises until the last light goes out. Are you sick of government lackeys who say you didn't build that? Are you tired of elitists who think you need a government permission slip for everything? Everything you do is an A to B conversation and the government should see their way out of it. Create true free markets by adopting the BIPCOT No Government License. The BIPCOT NoGov license allows user modification of any product, service, or software except by governments or government agents. Go to BIPCOT.org. That's Bravo, India, Papa, Charlie, Oscar, Tango, dot org. My fellow sheep, election season is upon us. Are you one of the 12% of Americans who still approves of our government? Then we need your help to force the other 88% into compliance. Our democracy depends on it. We're an organization called Citizens Against Too Much Unfettered Freedom, or CATMUF. CATMUF is a bipartisan flock of sheep whose goal is expanding government until nothing else remains. Because the government is here to help you. 
How can you help CatMuff help you? By only voting for candidates dedicated to expanding government. It's easy. You don't need to study the issues. No matter what a politician says when running for office, they're all dedicated to expanding government. And make sure you tell all your friends and family to vote for more government. Here at CatMuff, we don't care if you vote Democrat or Republican, as long as you vote for candidates committed to growing our federal family. CatMuff. Because folks just aren't smart enough to handle real freedom. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on theconsciousresistance.com and solpodcast.org. So today I'm delighted to have Jose Nino, who is a libertarian volunteerist coming out of Colorado. Uh, you can find him on Twitter at Jose A.L. Nino or on Facebook under Jose Nino. Uh, and uh, on Mises.org, um, you can find many of his articles where he's a, he's a prolific writer. Um, just look for Jose Nino or you can uh, type Jose, uh, Mises.org slash profile slash Jose dash Nino. And you'll find his um, voluminous work there on various topics. So he is um he's a he was born in Venezuela and he's got family in Venezuela and so naturally we will talk about Venezuela. <laughs> he has a family there so he he understands um you know uh, a very up close and personal uh, experience of what's going on down there as well as through his own research and understanding of economics and um and monetary theory. And things like that. So we're going to get into what's going on in Venezuela um, and why socialism is perhaps not the best way <laughs> to go about <laughs> organizing society. And um, and yeah, and, and what exactly is hyperinflation? Because this is really, I think, a very instructive situation if people can, uh, you know, can learn something from it. So, Jose, uh, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me on, Nilo. No problem, no problem. I heard you a couple of times on uh, Tom Woods. Uh, very informative, very instructive. I really appreciate that. And uh, and also on the Peace and Liberty um, podcast with uh, Stephen Clyde, I think his name is. And that was really awesome. So I'm like, I got to get this guy on my show because this is something... I know you talked about it a lot with various people, but it can't be talked about enough because you know, warning people of the dangers of socialism is something that can never get old i think because you know as we know it seems like every every state every nation state has as its end goal whether stated or unstated um you know complete totalitarian control or socialistic control uh of its economy so yeah so so this and this is a great uh, example of what that looks like um so so yeah but before we get into that um can we just um uh, let, can you tell my audience about your background, how you came to uh, libertarianism? Well, <clears throat> as I uh, mentioned before, um, I was born in Venezuela, but I came to the United States when I was relatively young, around six. This was the mid to late 1990s, and the situation in Venezuela was already starting to get bad. My parents with the tea leaves and everything and decided to go in search of greener pastures. And I lived in the States, specifically Texas, for pretty much the majority of my life. And during my time there, I came across the ideas of Ron Paul around 2007 and was just hooked with, to his message about uh, free market money, ending the Federal Reserve, limited government, and just getting the government out of our lives altogether. So it really resonated with me, and I took that into my college years and got involved with a lot of libertarian groups. I eventually headed up a libertarian group at the University of Texas at Austin, and I've lived abroad as well. I've lived in Chile for two years came back to the States. Now I work as like a political consultant and writer for various organizations. And I still 
talk about a lot of libertarian stuff, um, especially domestic matters. I do write about Venezuela as well, not as much as before, but the topic is something that I like to inform people about when asked about it because I do think it is the most visceral example of socialist failure we are currently witnessing. Yeah, and it's especially important now, given that it seems like people are becoming more and more enamored by the idea of socialism. <laughs> you know, they, they you know with Bernie Sanders, and now actually, um, uh, what's a woman? Uh, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. You heard about this woman? Uh, yes. What, what is it? Yes. The youngest oh. congresswoman, right? <laughs> Go ahead. Yes. Um, yeah, her story is just crazy. And I think it actually what's scary about Ocasio-Cortez is the fact that she's like the microcosm of what a lot of millennials think. She is almost a perfect embodiment. That's why I think she's very uh, scary due to the fact that a lot of people are going to grow up with her in politics. She's already in the spotlight without even taking office yet. And yeah. it's pretty bad if her ideas start to gain more relevance. Yes, yes, you're right. She's uh she is very reflective of the uh the zeitgeist of the times in that yeah, a lot of millennials yeah, they have this idea, you know, people walking around with um you know, what's it called? The uh, Che Guevara uh, t-shirts. <laughs> like people Oh, yes. <laughs> you know, people have this idea of socialism. I don't I don't understand it. You know, it's like how can you know so little about something and yet be so vocal um, as an advocate for it, you know, especially when it involves the, you know, the violence of the state, you know? Well, that's actually ironically testament to how good a lot of legacy institutions like the academia, the media, right. a lot of leftist politicians and grassroots activists have been when it comes to their marketing, irony aside. Because they've been been able to commoditize socialism in a way that no socialist would ever dream of. I don't think Che Guevara could imagine like a world where his T-shirts probably <laughs> net people millions of dollars <laughs> into profit and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, a political ideology that shuns and tries to destroy private enterprise, they certainly make a lot of money <laughs> selling these t shirts. <laughs> you know, I love, one of my favorite uh, uh, memes or cartoons is like you see, uh, you see um, yeah, an anarcho capitalist or an agorist um, selling. You know, Che Guevara T-shirts to a line of communists and, so, and socialists. You know, people who are advocating down with capitalism, <laughs> and this agorist is making you know a chuckload of money <laughs> off of these of the economic ignorance of the masses. So, yeah, that's the irony. Yeah, quite it's ironic. Very, uh, yeah, it's very hard to explain how that phenomenon emerged. Yeah. I mean, I don't I don't blame people. In, in fact, I, I cheer people who are able to look at that and say, you know what, I'm going to make money off these people. I don't care if what they're you know promoting is evil. I'm just going to make money. I mean, I think that's pretty smart, uh, pretty smart business strategy. Yeah, that is actually a pretty smart business strategy. I do work in marketing and similar fields, and that is actually a very good strategy because socialism is very much in vogue right now. Yes, yes. So, yeah, which is exactly why we must smash it, as uh, as Tom Woods would say, with a baseball bat. <laughs> so, so please uh, tell us about um, so, uh, Venezuela and um, you know your experiences, your family experiences um, of it, and you know you traveling back there, and uh, and what you've uncovered through your research. Well, Venezuela has always been of interest, given my connection to the country and i visited on numerous occasions throughout the 2000s the early like 21st century and i just saw a country that was just getting progressively more socialist and less prosperous you would see like um lines for basic food items like toilet paper sugar emerge you see shortages you'd see creeping inflation and a government that was just confiscating property arbitrarily. And a lot of this has been part of like Venezuela's like multi-decade legacy of embracing the socialism of one degree or another. 
something that's very missing, that's very <clears throat> misunderstood about Venezuela is the country has always been, for the most part, pretty socialist. Even in the more prosperous eras of the country, the state had a massive role in the economy. Um, government pretty much nationalized the oil industry in the 70s and turned it into a huge piggy bank for the government to buy votes, to consolidate more of their power, to reward cronious industries, and also politicize its central bank, which the government had a majority stock in. And one fun fact that a lot of um, your listeners might not know is that Venezuela has not had single-digit inflation since 1983. So Venezuelan millennials have never seen a year of inflation than 10%, and that's been part of the decay of Venezuela over the last few decades. In fact, in 1998, the average Venezuelan was poorer on a per capita GDP basis than a Venezuelan in 1958. And for that reason, Hugo Chavez was able to win resoundingly in the 1998 presidential elections because the country became poorer on net. And this was like in an era where it's like socialism was not as entrenched as it was from 1999 up until the present. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, yeah, I uh, yeah, I remember learning about that about how um yeah, Venezuela took control of the um the oil uh manufacturing and and production and and how you know it's it's very ironic how what, what is it, like Venezuela has like the most naturally occurring oil reserves and then like any other geographic location around the world and yet they're like um <laughs> you know the shortages of of various oil products is like <laughs> which to me illustrates the idea that the state you know when it takes control of any industry basically destroys it go, go ahead sorry that is correct danilo in fact uh venezuela is a very resource rich country but as we have seen State management of economic resources is a disaster waiting to happen. Um, one thing about the Venezuelan oil industry was that it's been nationalized since the 1970s, but at least the government did not have as much of a say in who they hired. They at least had like the most qualified people running it. Mm. But when Hugo Chavez came into power, the state-owned oil enterprise was just completely politicized, where they just fired all competent workers and put nothing but government cronies in there. That's the strongest case against the nationalization of any industry that if some lunatic takes control, they'll just completely destroy whatever meritocratic elements um, were left in, and just stuff it with government cronies that respond to political incentives, not market incentives. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you see that pattern all over the place, you know, like uh... I believe in South Africa now. You know the um, the, the the government is um, is seizing farms and trying. Uh, you know, saying that they're they're being um, you know run by these white people that are keeping food from the blacks. But but then when once the government takes them over, then you know of course they just get reduced to rubble and everything rots and gets destroyed. And, and in the end, everyone suffers. So you know when the state takes control, you know it's a monopoly, and so there's no competition. So what is the incentive? towards um you know quality um and uh efficiency you know there is no incentive they have no competition that's the beauty of the market right yes indeed um funny you mentioned south africa because i have written about south africa recently and it's it's essentially the next venezuela in many regards yeah it's a country that was once a regional leader in an otherwise troubled region like Africa and in Venezuela's case, Latin America, that is now falling for the siren song of state socialism. And there, it's going to be pretty nasty if they actually follow through with this land confiscation because um, say what you want about the South African white population. Yes, they have implemented terrible policies like apartheid, but they do bring like the most skilled labor that help uh, bring that country to the its vaunted status of like 
the richest country in Africa for some time. Yeah. But that can all go to waste because of that. And the Venezuelan case is a very strong example of how if you go through really rapid land confiscation and extensive expropriation, you will completely destroy your country's productivity base, thus making it poorer. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, it's kind of amusing when people, you know, illustrate, you know, how, you know, how efficient and, um, and um, per, you know, near perfect the uh, the socialism model is. You know, they reference the Scandinavian countries, right? Uh, Was like Denmark and things like that, places like that uh, that have you know such huge high tax rates, and they, they say, look at these people, you know, high levels of happiness and everything, and productivity and all that. And and what's 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 amusing and ironic is that the only reason that they're able to have such productivity or such let's say wealth is because it was created <laughs> in a in a relatively free market, very unregulated, and so they were given the freedom to innovate and create. And now, once the government takes control, it's like um, I, I I liken it to uh, um, you know a parade or or a parade happening, and then the you know someone steps in front of the parade and they claim credit for the parade so, so the state claims credit for the fruits that capitalism has produced yes that's actually very true and um yeah with the scandinavian case it's also like basically a rich family bestowing a bunch of wealth to their their children that are just profligate spenders spending it uh, left and right and not really creating any wealth and a lot of these Scandinavian countries in the 90s, they had to undertake numerous reforms to get their fiscal house in order, lest they wanted to turn into something like Venezuela. Venezuela tried to do some reforms in the 1990s, and they ultimately failed and led to Hugo Chavez's rise to power. And that was all she wrote from that point forward. Yeah, I mean, I mean, just look at any point in history, you know, when there's a... Um you know, a really fanatical despot or tyrant that rose to power. And, you know, just look a, a, a few years or decades before, and probably that 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 uh, nation was in a state of turmoil, chaos, confusion, disorder. You know, people, they don't know what's happening, and they're looking to one person, you know, to lead them out of it, right? And that's exactly, that's the perfect, um, what do you call that? Like, just, just yeah, the, the, the perfect scenario for you know a despot like you know stalin like hitler like you know <laughs> name your murderous uh murderous despot in history you know and 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 you you can see his pattern repeat yes um crisis is the lifeblood right. of the state and for future demagogues especially now that you've had over a century's worth of public school indoctrination, you're going to see lots of demagoguery in the West. And it's bad because you're going to have a lot of people that are going to get really ticked off once if inflation becomes a thing, once the welfare state starts collapsing and people begging for more government and their wealth erodes. They're just going to turn to insert demagogue X this story has played out a lot. This is nothing new in history. Look at um, ancient Rome. In many regards, we are, we are following the same path of, uh, as Rome. If history doesn't repeat itself, it at least rhymes. <laughs> That's one of my favorite Mark Twain quotes. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, are you familiar with Mike Maloney from goldsilver.com? I am not. Yeah, he is an excellent um, author. He, he wrote a book about precious metals, but also about monetary history, about economics, free markets, things like that. And he also um, produced this documentary, mini documentary series called Hidden Secrets of Money. And um, and fascinating, excellent, well-made, you know, an, animated and just very educational, informative, free on YouTube. And, uh, and actually interesting, you mentioned Rome because uh, so far he's made 10 episodes and the last two episodes... Um, both cover the parallels of the path that the United States is on and ancient Rome and, and the, you know, the moments that led up to the collapse of ancient Rome and how they, you know, pretty much mirror what's going on in the United States in terms of, you know, debasing the money in terms of spending massively on public works in terms of imperialism. 
you know, and and, and all these kinds of you know, th- and and you know, some of the things was happening in Venezuela, you know, and um, seizing um, seizing the control of industries and imposing price controls, wage controls, things like that. So yeah, fascinating uh, parallels. Yeah, if you want to understand politics, read up on your history. I'm a, uh, I actually was like a history major. I focused main, mainly on like East Asia and Latin America, but I've, all, um, I re- I've read history from all over. To truly understand politics, if you have a good grasp of history, you'll be good to go because a lot of things that we see today have happened before or some variant of it have happened before. And there's just a lot of historical ignorance these days because of the fact that like the education system is terrible. That's what happens when you let the state control it and monopolize it. You have tons of people coming out of history departments and economics departments filled with either Marxism, Keynesian, Keynesianism, or whatever statist order of the week ideology is in vogue. Um, it, it's, um, it's, it's pretty bad, and um, with the whole this whole Venezuelan thing, I think when it's said and done, you're probably going to see historians downplay as much as possible and give really weak excuses like saying, "Oh, it's just low commodity prices, corruption, mismanagement, yada yada yada," while ignoring the elephant in the living room that is socialism. Yeah, can you get into uh, because one thing I enjoy talking to people about is economics, uh, especially monetary economics, because most people have no idea about it, they have no opinion on it, and so it's something that I think a lot of people are open to hearing. Like for example, certain topics are much more um, sensitive to most people. Like for example, immigration. A lot of people have you know strong opinions about immigration, maybe taxation. People have strong opinions on taxation, right? Um, or welfare, let's say. People have strong opinions on welfare. But you talk about Federal Reserve, they don't know if you know anything about it. <laughs> what about, uh, you know, what do you, what do you think the interest rate should be? They don't care. What do they care? <laughs> they have no idea, you know? So, um, yeah, that's why monetary economics, to me, is something no, that, that I'd like that's to talk actually about. A good, Go ahead. That's actually a good point, Danilo. Um, I'm no monetary expert, but I am relatively well-read on the subject of central banking and it is one of the more taboo subjects that we see in academia and just like in general, like media and politics, because when you actually look at it, the 20th century megastate, like the progressive megastate we, we've seen over the last century or so, central banking is at the core of it, because when you're able to inflate a currency out the wazoo and control it, you can finance whatever sweetheart political program politicians want to um, have because back then you'd have to tax people. And with taxa- direct taxation, a lot of people at least could see the blatant like cost um, of that type of taxation, how it affected them and burdened them. And you'd see tax revolts practically in every society throughout history due to excessive taxation. Now, with inflation, it gets more insidious because it's like a slow and creeping form of taxation that is technically um, disconnected from a type of political accountability mechanism. Because at least in theory, you could vote the bums out of office if they raise your taxes and stuff like that. But with inflation, it's controlled by bureaucrats, by Federal Reserve bureaucrats that can stay in their position indefinitely. And it's very difficult to attack because they work in the shadows. It's, it's basically the deep state. You all just talk about the deep state um, in the Trump era. Reality is the deep state's been around since the Federal Reserve was created. In fact, it's enabled by it. And you can make the argument that it is an, uh, the deep state as well. And the Federal Reserve and all these other central banks, like say like the Venezuelan Central Bank, have been absolutely destructive when it comes to destroying uh, people's wealth and concentrating political power in the government and its cronies. 
Yeah, yeah, it's such an important point, you know, talking about the Federal Reserve with people because, yeah, so many people are just completely ignorant. So for that reason, can you please get into some details about uh, Venezuela and what's going on with the hyperinflation, like how fast are prices rising? And, you know, because I, I, I know that, you know, Jeff Berwick went down there. He did some videos about, you know, showing, you know, the uh, <laughs> the prices in like in like restaurants have to be changed every day. I don't know. Do people get paid every day? You know, and things like that. Can you can you get into a little bit about that? Well, um, I haven't really kept up with the inflation rates lately because Venezuela's in hyperinflationary mode now. It's well, it's been in hyperinflationary mode since 2016, and for a country to be technically in hyperinflation, um, an economist Philip Kagan said that. It's an it's monthly inflation rate has to be at least like fifty percent or higher. Oh shoot! Wow. Um, one figure yeah. I saw actually for Venezuela was that inflation was like at like sixty five thousand percent or something like that. Some insane number, <laughs> and it's not really surprising because there were some reports from the Venezuelan central bank um, in twenty seventeen, especially toward the end of the year that the central bank was increasing the money supply by 10% on a weekly basis. So it's not shocking why Venezuela reached this point. And as far as how people get paid, um, lots of sectors of the Venezuelan economy are already like de facto dollarized, meaning that people are relying on dollars in the black market to like store their wealth and conduct their transactions because the Bolivar, the national currency, is it's completely worthless. In fact, when criminals rob you in Venezuela, they rob you of like your durable goods and stuff like that, not your money because <laughs> oh, it just has no value. Um, also, you're seeing the emergence of crypto. Bitcoin is really popular over there. Mm. And a lot of people are turning to that, especially amongst the more tech-savvy Venezuelans. Hmm. Yeah, I, yeah, I remember I remember reading about that, about how yeah, cryptocurrency is... Um... It's like a lifeboat for them, and which is which is wonderful. It's a great case, um, a great illustration of the usefulness of of cryptocurrency in these kinds of uh, you know situations where the state is you know genuinely you know robbing you at an enormous rate. You know, what one one um one great um quote from Peter Schiff. I remember when he um he said, um, taxation is when the state steals your money, um. Uh, but uh, inflation is when you still have your money, but they steal the value of your money. <laughs> and I thought that was a wonderful illustration. Yes, that's actually a really good point um, because, yeah, like this goes back to my point about like tax revolts. Most tax revolts emerge whenever the state like has like confiscatory levels of taxation. Right. Whereas inflation. Um, is definitely like a more of a a creeping phenomena where the value of like your money lo um, loses, like depreciates over time, and in the more extreme cases like Venezuela, it'll it will basically turn into a form of theft because it's basically the money printers and the groups that see the money first that are the ones that benefit the most, and the rest of the people get the scraps, meaning um, they get monopoly money yeah. at best when it yeah. comes to the value yeah when i tell people about inflation you know and how terrible and insidious it is um a frequent response i get is like well you know it's not that bad because if they print the money and then they spend it it goes into circulation it's like water you know you pour water in a big tub it's just going to you know even out very quickly whereas i think frederick hayek i think he um he stated that no inflation is more like dropping, uh, you know, like a dollop of honey onto a plate, <laughs> and how how slowly that, you know, assimilates and spreads out. That's how slowly, um, you know, everything else evens out and the price. Everyone's like, well, everyone's wages are, everyone's wages go up, and you know, prices do go up, but the wages do go up. So, so it's not that bad. But no, it's more like you know, it's it doesn't spread fast and even out fast. It spreads very slowly. And the people that, as you said, that benefit are the first users, right? The the state and all the uh, the corporations that deal with the state, and you know the politicians and things like that. Yes, the 
Yeah, it, it's actually pretty bad that people think like inflation is normal right. when it's 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 a it's a monetary phenomena. Yeah, central banking has become kind of like a baseline of sorts, like almost like furniture in the living room that everybody takes as a given. Like they don't really they don't they like don't really they they kind of see it, but they don't understand that this stuff is actually like abnormal when you think about it. That's just like the centuries worth of progressive era statism combined with the state indoctrination centers that are public schools and just a cultural acceptance of like the state in our lives that has conditioned us into believing that central banking is normal the idea of like a monopolized bank printing out excessive amount of money is normal and the result is it's going to be a collapse one way or the other Mm -hmm. once the modern day welfare state collapses um i think it's it's just going to go downhill from there yeah 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 i mean uh yeah one one example i'd like to use to illustrate the idea of inflation is um you know people especially people who advocate for minimum wage we need 15 dollars 15 dollars living wage right and so uh and so i tell them you know before 1965 the minimum wage was 5 quarters but the difference is those quarters were 90% silver, right? And so if you were to take those same quarters and buy them today, um, one quarter, I think I think one quarter is roughly equal to $5 today, right? <laughs> so, mm-hmm. so five, 90% silver quarters as a minimum wage in 1964 pays much more than the minimum wage today of what seven fifty eight dollars <laughs> if if each one is five dollars it's what's a twenty five dollars <laughs> for a minimum wage <laughs> so I, I always like that's one thing to illustrate how you know how much the currency has been destroyed actually it's funny you mention minimum wage danilo because venezuela has done tons of minimum wage increases over the past few years due to the inflation and has done nothing but just like kill their private sector. Sure. Um, and that's the thing too about the inflation death spiral is that once like your country's in fiscal dire straits and the government starts cranking out the printing presses, um, it turns into a vicious cycle of more inflation and thus more intervention because people think, oh, if we can just like legislate higher wages. That'll fix everything, but it won't. It's just going to create another set of problems like unemployment, and then the politicians are going to double down and say, "Oh, we need to like increase unemployment insurance." It's just like a <laughs> downward spiral of economic statism that will just destroy a country. Yeah, one uh, intervention leads to another intervention leads to another, and and it kind of yeah. reminds me of ancient Rome. Uh, in uh, in his uh, series, Mike Maloney mentioned. Ancient Rome, I think it was Emperor Diocletian when uh, when there was hyperinflation going on and the, the currency just being destroyed. You know, they're clipping the coins and diluting it with other base metals, and and so prices began to rise. So people were blaming, of course, the business owners, right? Evil capitalist mm-hmm. business owners, stop fleecing the people. And so what they do, they passed a law. I think it was called the Edict of Prices, which was basically a price ceiling. You cannot raise your price past this point. And, uh, and you know, what, what ends up happening, either people close down or you go to the black market, right? <laughs> and they do it under the table. So either way it gets done or, or either, or people lose. <laughs> yes. And in fact, like that's another great historical lessons. Price controls are as ancient as ancient Western civilization. Yeah. And Venezuela has, has plenty of, of price controls, uh, price ceilings, and all those wacky government edicts. And the result has been the same. Massive shortages, just destruction of the private sector, and like um, these arguments of like corruption and mismanagement, like they're kind of correct, but they don't go further. They don't understand this corruption mismanagement is a feature of socialism because socialism tries to play God with an economy that has its own laws the laws of economics are strong and you can try to try to subvert them as much as possible but they will end up biting you in the rear in the long term <laughs> yeah biting in the rear indeed um yeah i mean i mean uh yeah what was i gonna say um 
Oh, oh yeah, I remember the. I remember reading about uh, how Venezuela, the average Venezuelan, has lost like twenty pounds since the past couple of years, something like that, because you know of all the starvation and shortages, and now people are resorting to you know, like um, scavenging for rats and what pigeons or or zoo animals and things like that. Um, yeah, <laughs> what can you tell us about that? Well, socialism is the ultimate crash diet. If you think about it, <laughs> right. because all the shortages and destruction of private property just makes it impossible to produce goods on the market. Right. Um, yeah. I've heard like re some really like huge horror stories where like dogs on the streets are like non-existent yeah. and you just put two and two together. What's right. happening. Right. And, and that's the thing as well that actually, Animal rights people, they should be like in favor of capitalism because animals are treated so much better in capitalist westernized countries because of the fact that there is private property. There is respect for like the rule of law and like the non-aggression principle for the most part. But the food shortages are pretty bad and it doesn't help either that there's also a lot of exchange controls that don't allow for the entrance of foreign currencies and speculation so it's become very very bad a lot of sectors including like the airline sector um they've had to cancel flights so p because of the lack of dollars in the economy and foreign investment due to these controls so if you're a venezuelan that's trying to get out of the country you have to probably go by foot or by um bus or whatever if even the bus infrastructure exists because a lot of basic infrastructure in Venezuela is just gone kaput because of the institutional uncertainty hmm. and economic destruction that socialism has brought about in the country. Yeah, I've, I've, I've heard that it's getting more and more difficult for people to leave and, and that the end goal is that the borders will eventually be shut down completely and people will be prevented from leaving is that is, have you heard that as well i mean i i definitely see that because um i mean it's kind of like the berlin wall as well it was like designed to keep the east germans in and there are some other measures that the venezuelan government ha has made where they brought what's it, uh what's called an alcalbala which is like a medieval type of highway tax where literally government officials that are essentially highway robbers can stop you at any checkpoint and charge you a fee. And if you can't pay this fee, they will not allow you to pass. Wow. It's a form of highway robbery and all this stuff has popped up. And even if they don't close the border um, directly, they'll essentially make it impossible for people to leave um, especially for people with very little resources, you will probably have to risk certain starvation or something like that to get out of the country and live and like go through really dangerous parts of the country. So it's a very nasty situation that will keep a lot of people from potentially leaving. Yeah. So, okay. So, so people listening to this and everything that's going on, it sounds so, um, dismal and dark and so what would you say like if they say okay so what's your solution how do how does venezuela get out of this what, what, what would you uh what would you say to somebody like that i'd say that um i'd say keep promoting crypto in venezuela especially bitcoin i do believe crypto does solve a lot of the problems of fiat money and especially like state controlled money because the unique um value proposition of crypto is people voluntarily transact in it and give it value through their use and they and they do this in a free market environment whereas fiat money is just done because some bureaucrat politician or whatever drafts up a law or an ordinance and says this is the money of the land take it or leave it and or you get thrown in jail for that but um, I think as well, I would say private um, defense can play a huge role too. With the rise of defense distributed and like 3D printable firearms, 
I think that could play a huge role in liberating the country without having to go to using a traditional government in, uh, military intervention. I think that we do have a lot of 21st century technology that could disintermediate the state in Venezuela and countless other repressive regimes. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Technology is uh, is definitely the savior of humanity. I I remember learning about um, during the Soviet Union time um, how you know since there are such immense shortages in terms of food and medicine, how the only way that they were actually surviving and getting food is through the black markets as well as medicine keeping them healthy. <laughs> it was through the black markets. I, I assume that's a similar case in Venezuela. Yeah, the black market is massive in Venezuela. That's where you get the dollars. You get um, the, the the food, airline tickets, everything. It's obviously marked up, but that's how people survive. Mm-hmm. And it's actually really messed up too because the Venezuelan government has actually tried to crack down on a lot of these black market sellers that are called bachaqueros. Hmm. Bachaqueros is lit- um, literally leaf cutter ant in Venezuelan Spanish. Hmm. And these people will – will have like black market goods and sell them at a premium and politicians will, will complain like, it's like, Oh my gosh, why are you selling this stuff so marked up when we're like in such inflation? And the reality is it's because there's such terrible price controls that these people are responding in a way to like correct for these government inefficiencies. And unfortunately, most people don't think in those terms and they just think, oh, we need to throw these people in jail. We need to like crack down on this. It's like I said, it's a death spiral of economic stupidity on display. Yeah. Um, yeah. It reminded me of, uh, you know, the idea of price gouging um, and, you know, the, you know, when there's a um, a disaster, like, a, you know, a hurricane or, or um, you know, earthquake or flood or something and, you know, you know, Population is completely destroyed. Houses, houses tum- uh, crumble to the ground, and then people come in with like maybe food or generators or water and charge you know exorbitant prices. And of course, you got the uh, you know the bleeding heart people. Of, what is it? The liberals or Democrats? And you know, you people are just um, taking advantage of other people that are uh, that are uh, you know hurting and in need. And and just like you said, you know, they're responding to economic incentive. You know, it's like this is where resources are needed. Right. And so they're going in there and they're selling. like, what are you doing? You're just on Twitter <laughs> complaining <laughs> that this person is actually there helping these people, giving them stuff, you know, and 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 um, eventually what ends up happening is because of the incentive for profit, it incentivizes other people to come in and bring their resources. And so what, what ends up happening due to a competition, the price goes back down, back to where it should be, back to parity. So <laughs> the economic in- ignorance is uh, is staggering. You know that, Danilo, that's how markets work. But for a lot of ivory tower bobbleheads that we see in the media and throughout legacy institutions, that kind of stuff just flies over their heads. Uh, Modern day politics is all about satisfying short term whims and consolidating political support. And those types of environments are just terrible for any type of large scale economic growth and like human development. And unfortunately it's starting to become on in vogue in a lot of the first world in the West. And it's going to turn out the same, just like how it did in Rome, how it did in Venezuela. And it's pretty sad that people still don't really read up on their history. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, um, what do they say? You, you start off in sandals and you, you know, climb the mountain and then you're in glass, you know, you're, you're in your, your, um, your silk slippers and then you descend back in sandals <laughs> it's a cycle right people yeah. <laughs> don't learn they don't learn from history um and, and it kind of reminds me there's another cartoon i remember seeing where you, a person goes to jail and they see three people there and it says what are you in for and one guy's like oh i i raised my prices too high and for price gouging and the other person's like um oh i raised my price i i, I set my prices too low I, I was charged with predatory pricing and the third person says well my prices were just like everyone else so i was charged with collusion <laughs> <laughs> that's government land for you you can't win you can't win it's like uh it's like you know the uh the book um by uh was a harvey S- silverglate um uh it was a three felonies a day 
right? How how the feds uh, what was it harm the innocent or control the innocent? Like like how you know there's so many taxes, so many regulations, so many laws that if you were to come under the uh, you know the eye of Sauron of the state for any reason, you know they could they could sift through your background, through your paperwork, through your history, and they will find somewhere somehow a place where you violated a law. <laughs> <laughs> or not even that. Just go on. The, just go on the highway. How many people go? How many people uh, drive below the speed limit? Right. <laughs> like, like people violating the laws every single day. Um, and yeah, so we're all criminals. Yes, yeah, so uh, that there was like a very good quote I think by uh, the Roman historian Tacitus, where he says like the more laws there are in a nation the more corrupt it is just paraphrasing yeah. i might have butchered it completely but yeah. yeah it's like um it's what happens when you let politicians set policy instead of civil society and basic cultural norms and courtesy be the like the main drivers of um social organization and yeah th this this type of stuff has been transported all over the world especially the third world a lot of the third world, as from my travels and my experiences living in countries like Chile, a lot of people think that the first world is rich because they have welfare states and stuff like that. It's completely off base. And unfortunately, these countries are paying the price for it. And it's going to come full circle back to the U.S. too because um, the, the current climate really just is infatuated with socialism, with the idea that handouts will solve your problems immediately. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lesson that um, it seems like every few generations we have to learn again, unfortunately. And, uh, you know, we have those few people who understand the process and the pattern. And, you know, we're the writers, the authors, the podcasters, the YouTubers that are trying to warn everyone else um, as much as possible. And thankfully, I think with the Internet, it's so much easier to warn other people um, because of the <clears throat> just explosion of content, of information, you know, and the ability to f figure this stuff out and research it is so much easier than it used to be. And so I think that, um, you know, the century of, uh, you know, the 20th century of socialism is, um, you know, I think that will be a bygone era, hopefully. <laughs> I think the internet is expediting the process of educating um, the masses. So what do you, what do you think? I agree with you as well, Danilo. The internet has been a very powerful tool in unmasking um, a lot of like this information we've seen on uh, socialist propaganda. And a lot more people now, at least when you compare it to, say, the 20th century, they know about Austrian economics. They know about sound money. They know about how central planning is not how you organize a society. And the internet has empowered all these people, and they've become, like you said, po podcasters, thought leaders, entrepreneurs that advocate for these ideas. That's why I tell people, like, it's not all doom and gloom. No. I do think there are some bad uh, macro trends out there, but if people put in the work and become more compelling as libertarian advocates, we can see a total tidal shift, a tidal wave of opinion shift in our favor. Yeah, yeah, it's not all doom and gloom. I think that's also very important to emphasize, especially on a topic like this. Um, so in closing, um, so yeah, so maybe give your final remarks about Venezuela and, and um, you know, what you see the uh, the very near future happening with them. And, you know, hopefully um, it'll be like, you know, just ripping off a Band-Aid and it'll be quick and it'll be over. But I'm, I'm not, I'm not uh, assuming everyone's going to emerge, you know, a libertarian, Austrian economic... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> volunteers but uh i don't know hopefully they'll learn their lesson at least for a few generations well i think with venezuela it's the poster child of modern day socialist failure like if you just look at the country it it has like practically all of like the templates and communist manifesto and it's almost followed it to a t and it has failed to a t as well if you want to look at what socialism is Venezuela is your exhibit A. Now, as far as the future of Venezuela, I think in the short to midterm, I'm very pessimistic. I think the country is just going to continue to go into the economic doldrums. Long term, 
who knows because I think with the rise of Bitcoin um, and cryptocurrency, a lot of people now are turning to that as an alternative to the <coughs> destructive fiat regime that the country has been subjected to over the past 80 years. And I think with technology advancing and knowledge spreading, the country will probably get back to its feet long term. Yeah. Yeah. One can only hope, right? <coughs> um, so before we go, I ask this of all my guests. Um, what is your favorite quote of all time? Well, that one's, um, <laughs> that's a tough one. <laughs> yeah. So many good ones, right? Yes. Um, um, hmm. <laughs> I would say I would say um, Ludwig von Mises' quote about I'm just paraphrasing this. Sure. I, I don't know the exact wording about uh, every socialist is a disguised dictator. <laughs> That's my. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, or, or or kind of the way I describe democracy, which is like uh, instead of you know people putting their faith in you know a king or um, a politician, you know, democracy is everybody's a little mini dictator trying to control their neighbor. <laughs> you know, That's what it essentially is. Yeah. Yeah. Um Yeah, so um so yeah, <clears throat> the idea is um freedom, voluntarism. The idea is, you know, live your life and respect the the property rights, the self-ownership of other people if you wish them to respect them in you. I think that's the overarching message that uh, I try to convey and I believe you try to convey as well. Um and uh, it's a simple message, you know, but it seems like it's a tough pill to swallow for most people. But, uh, you know, we're uh, doing our best. You know, you're doing your wonderful work with your writing, with the uh, with the um, the articles on Mises.org. So please, everyone, check that out. Um, Jose Nino on, on Mises.org, as well as Facebook and Twitter. Jose Nino, um, he's putting out some wonderful content. So go on and support him. And, uh, yeah, so thanks a lot for coming on the show, Jose. I really appreciate it. So this is uh, Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on theconsciousresistance.com and solpodcast.org. Wishing all of you have a wonderful day. Take care. It was Bye. a pleasure chatting with you, Daniel. Thank you for having me on. Pleasure. Thanks a lot. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this content and would like to see more of it, please feel free to donate and help me interview other fascinating people. You can do so through Patreon. That's patreon.com slash peaceful anarchism to help me out. A dollar a show is all I ask. If you feel so inclined to donate more, please feel free. It will only assist me in spreading the message of freedom and voluntarism that much farther and that much more efficiently. You can also donate to my Bitcoin. My Bitcoin address is in the description to my videos as well as on my website, peacefulanarchism.com. And while you're on my site, there's a donate button to donate through PayPal. If you prefer to donate through PayPal, you can do so with that. But Patreon is a little bit easier for content creators as you can set up a recurring donation if you so desire. Also, while you're on my website, peacefulanarchism.com, please feel free to sign up, enter your email address, sign up for my newsletter, and you'll receive updates every time I post something, a video or an interview. I do not send out any spam. Or you can also follow me on Facebook under facebook.com slash peaceful anarchism or facebook.com slash Danilo Cuellar 3, I believe. Danilo Cuellar 3. So either, either one of those methods, if you are able to donate, I would be most appreciative. Thank you very much for listening. 
I hope you have a magnificent day. Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government control 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the Bipcot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com.